Praise the Lord. We were just singing that there is no one like our Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to go into a new series. Uh, the elders, God willing, will uh, be speaking through a new series called The New and Living Way. The New and Living Way. And uh, uh, there will be multiple parts to this series. And uh, I get to do the introduction uh, today. So we've been learning more about what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary and the new way that he opened up as we were just singing about. There is no one like our Lord. There's no one like our Lord. Amen. Amen. So by way of introduction, let me start by saying in God's work of creation, the crowning act, the pinnacle of his divine work was the creation of man or human beings. It was to humans that he assigned and stamped his divine image. We are created in the image of God, gives us the highest place among earthly beings. And that image provides us the unique ability to mirror and reflect the very character of God. But since the tragic fall of Adam and Eve, our great grandparents in the Garden of Eden, this image has been subject to some corruption or some change. And as a result of this distortion, we see that it is uh, corrupted, it is blurred, it is not to the same way that God had originally intended. God uh, did not, though, completely take away this image, and we are left with some remnants of that in the form of human dignity. It is not something that we are inherently having, but it is given to us by the Lord. Human beings have dignity because God is who created him, and uh, we, he has assigned uh, each and every human being uh, human dignity. If you go to... Uh, that slide for me, the Barna uh, slide on the 2020 American worldview. We see there that in August of 2020, they took 2,000 Americans and it, um, polled them. This is a Christian Cultural Research Center poll. And you can see, according to this, that many professing Christians are unprofessing pagans. What do I mean by that? I don't know if you could see those numbers, but let me explain. When a question was asked, having any type of faith is what matters, not the particular type of faith. There was 63% of all adults, 62% of Pentecostals that said that's what matters, that any type of faith is fine. When they were asked a question, uh, later on down there, it says a person who is generally good and does good things for others, can they earn a place in heaven? And it was 58%, uh, 48% uh, of all Americans, and then 46% of Pentecostals said, if you do some good acts, you can earn a place in heaven. So if you step back and look at the big picture of what all this means, it is suggesting that anything goes is what is the cultural norm of today. That even among professing Christians, evangelicals, Pentecostals, that there is no uh, absolute truths. Adam shedi, Adam shedi. They're wishy-washy in their beliefs. They're saying if you have some sort of faith or if you do good, that you can end up uh, earning a place in heaven. That is self-justification, and we know that if you're a true child of God, studying the word of God, that that is not true. So let us look at that, um, and look at this question, are human beings generally good? Are human beings generally good? If you study the Bible from front to back, the Old Testament to New Testament, we see that although Adam and Eve was created uh, without sin, we see that sin entered into the world 
through the uh, fault of our forefathers, Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, the Lord had commanded them, you can eat of every tree of the garden, but one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And on the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And guess what our forefathers did? They ate of that tree, and then death entered into the world. We see in Psalms 51, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So uh, if you study Ephesians, we've studied that whole book here before. We see that we were dead in our trespasses and sins once we walked after the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So our natural tendency is to be disobedient to God ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. And even Adam and Eve could not uh, obey God. And we see in Colossians, you were dead in your trespasses and un uncircumcision of your flesh. In John chapter 3, it says, Truly I say unto you, because of this death, the spiritual death you, you have, unless you're born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Which is uh, talking about spiritual rebirth. So, are, are human beings generally good? Are our friends that don't have Christ in their life that are our good friends in school, uh, that they are following other gods, or our unsaved friends, are they, or us before we were saved, are we in sin? All human beings have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that is something that we generally don't think about or accept. We think that people are generally good as that poll showed, but the word of God says something differently. If you go, uh, I pulled up all the verses and there's over 150 verses that can be shown to prove this. The, along the same question, the next question that is, uh, that I posed is, in answering, are human beings generally good? Human beings, are they able to do good things on their own? Even a philanthropist who wants to give away their money, they have some ulterior motive in giving their money. Their name is gonna be on that building, or on that chair, there might be other factors driving them. Like I said, they are not without dignity or respect, but their uh, emotion, their, their motivation is not in a good way. And that is what the Word of God again teaches us. I pulled up some verses here from the Old Testament that says, the Lord, right from the start, you know, you might think it's the 21st century, and it is because of the advent of television or internet that people are evil. And I've heard people ask me, wow, look at the society, it's going bad. Look at all the stuff, the wars and uh, the diseases and everything like that. But that was there in Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intention or thoughts of the heart of the man was evil continually. How many of you are willing to say your uh, thoughts and uh, everything was evil before you found the Lord? We think that we're generally good. But Job says we are mortals, uh, and, and it talks about how uh, we are vile and corrupt and drink up evil like water. Ecclesiastic says, there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Isaiah 64 says, all of us have become unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags that shrivel up like a leaf. And the wind and the sins sweep us away. Well, you say that's the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament and see what it says. If you go to Romans, we'll see Paul eloquently writing to the church in Rome, convincing them none is righteous, not even one. No one who understands, no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Not one, not even one. To finish that story, when we speak of the fall of Adam and Eve and the original spin, we're talking not just about that sin, but the consequences of that sin has been poured out into all of mankind. All, for all generation, all future mankind uh, has this original sin or tendency for sin, 
and that is uh, known in different um, philosophical or theological thoughts as different things. You know, total corruption uh, or radical depravity is what uh, the Armenians and the Calvinists say about this. So um, we can see in the New Testament here that uh, in James chapter 3 verse 8 says, no human being can tame their tongue. And uh, if they say there is no sin, as it says in 1 John, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you have time, please go and study Romans chapter 3 verse uh, chapter 3 and you will see the problem that I'm talking about. But it also has the solution and the blessings in the next chapters as well. See, from Adam to Moses, there was no law that was given, right? And people uh, were continuing to sin. And then when lo the law was given at the time of Moses, we see that the law was just a standard that no human being could adhere to. No man was able to adhere to the standards, as it says in Romans. And uh, because of that, there was this continual perpetual nature of corruption and our human nature is corrupted by sin. So all I'm saying as I'm summarizing that part is that we are naughty by nature or bad to the bone if you want to call it. We're all born in a state of sin as mortal creatures destined for death by the, the sin committed by Adam in the Garden of Eden and the sin nature that flew uh, through that into all of humanity. I think this is a generally accepted concept in all of Christendom, no matter what uh, religious sect or denomination you be, uh, belong to. So uh, the depravity of man, if there was no depravity of man, there was no need for Jesus, right? Yes, Jesus was the remedy for our sin. He was the antidote for our sin. And the reason that we needed uh, Jesus is because of our sinful nature. Let me go into a little bit more detail. Andrew Joseph, who was here, if you came here Saturday morning, you saw his illustration about the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. I have... Uh, some more teachings on that that I want to re-illustrate. I know all of you were not there. So uh, when we talk about the natural man, we're talking about a man that is born into a human family and lives in his natural state without being a child of God. When we talk about the spiritual man, we're talking about someone who was born into God's family and lives in a spiritual state listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about the carnal man, we're talking about someone who was born into God's family and still behaves as a man in the natural state, living according to his carnal and fleshly desires. I want to uh, have this life application for you. Who is on the throne of your life? If you could go back to that previous one, you see that you, you see the natural man is just living out life. YOLO, you only live once, right? So just enjoy life. But you see the spiritual man has God before I. But the carnal man, even though he has God in that picture, the I is who is sitting on the throne of his life. We might all say we have accepted the Lord Jesus as our personal savior, so we're not living in a natural man state. But are we living in a carnal state or a spiritual state? And that is the question I have for you today. Who, is the who has the throne of your life? If you go on to the next slides, I go into a little bit more detail here about the difference between the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And I think Andrew uh, explained it very well. You see that self is on the seat, the throne of his life, in the natural man, and he is uh, wanting to do what pleases his flesh, what pleases his flesh. He's not, he's not uh, thinking after anything of the Lord. In fact, the things of the Lord is foolishness to him. He will deny the very existence of sin and uh, only will change when things will negatively affect him, like his health or something else. 
Um, so we see that that is the natural man. The carnal man, as we talked about, may have accepted the Lord Jesus, and they are not established. They're spiritually immature. They're backslidden, and they are always feeling like they're condemned. But the spiritual man is established, rooted, and is spirit dominating his life, not, uh, not sin. Or when sin comes, he's able to overcome sin by the help of the Holy Spirit, which dominates his life. And I have some more uh, on that, but I think I will move on to the antidote, which is the Lord Jesus. So what is the solution? You might ask me, uh, we have explained the reasoning for a new way. The old way, from the very top, if you go back to that Romans chapter 3, you see that it talks about uh, what is in our tongue. It is the poison of vipers, right? And it talks about how our feet are going to sin. So from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, uh, we are not able to please God because we are born as a uh, natural or sinful man. But the Lord uh, God, God had a solution. He needed to uh, find a solution. And uh, in his foreknowledge, he had this planned very well uh, that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into the world. Why do we need to accept the Lord Jesus as our personal savior then? Because we are all naughty by nature. We are all sinful human beings. So if there's anybody hearing the voice uh, today, my voice today, or anyone in the church that has not accepted the Lord Jesus as their personal savior, I urge you to do that. Because even a child who knows the, uh, the difference between right and wrong, if they're choosing the wrong thing because of their sinful nature, they need redemption. And that is only achieved once and for all by the blood that was shed on the cross for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In order for us to live a victorious Christian life, a spiritual life, we need to have the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior. And after we accept him as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit guiding our step every step of the way. Amen. So can we go to uh, this portion from Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 through 7, if you can put that up for me, Reuben. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that bought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross as we we're just singing in Malayalam, is the only way that we could have a right relationship with the Lord. By his death, he bought us peace. He bought us healing. By his wounds, we are healed. Uh, by his blood, we have peace. All us, we have gone astray and turned everyone to his own ways, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of all of us. The Lord Jesus took upon his body, all of the sins of mankind. And because he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and he kept his mouth close, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before his shearers, he was silent and did not open his mouth. He followed through with the plan of Father and took upon himself the sins of the world. And because he did that, he gained many things. You know, as I was uh, at Sunday school this morning, Gabriel and I think it was Aksa's class, every one of them said that there were, as they said their verses, there was death through Adam. The first Adam brought us death, but the last Adam brought us life. If you go to Romans chapter 5, uh, 1, 2, and 9, you can see, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the blood and the sacrifice once and for all done by the Lord Jesus has brought us justification. It has brought us peace with our, uh, with our Lord Jesus and given us access. So the next thing that says is uh, it has given us access. 
And those who have been freed and justified and given peace, what do they do next? We rejoice in the hope of our glory. As we'll go into worship a few minutes from now, I want you to feel liberated and know that you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. If you have your prison clothes taken off, if you have been redeemed, you cannot sit there quietly. We need to rejoice and give him the glory because we have been given access. You know, there's different ways to think about this. Just like my children have access to me and they can come and ask me, Daddy, what's this? We have been given that access where before in the Old Testament times, and I studied a lot of this, you know that it only on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, after purifying himself, would be able to enter the holiest of holies. But here we see that uh, Jesus tore the veil from the top to the bottom. God tore the veil, opening a new way, giving us access to the Father. And that is the basis of us being able to go to him and cry out, Abba, Father, in every one of our needs, because he is our daddy. He is our father. Amen. He has made us righteous, not any righteousness of our own. You know, if we're trying to work out uh, 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 our salvation through our works, if we're trying to claim uh, heaven through our works, our good works, as we read in that poll, it is filthy rags we read, filthy rags. Only because we're covered by that perfect sacrifice, that lamb, do we have righteousness. So can we be righteous on our own merits or by our own works? No, only by the blood of Jesus, his imputed righteousness, just as if Adam had sin imputed upon us by him being the federal head of all humankind. Jesus Christ became our savior and he imputed righteousness so that we can come to the father at any time, not just once a year, like the high priest could do in the Old Testament, but he tore the veil from the top to the bottom. If sin had reigned, grace also may also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if there's any hope uh, for us, our hope is in the Lord Jesus that he has given us eternal life. Amen. If you study the book of Hebrews, this is what we see from the beginning all the way to chapter 12. Uh, we'll see that Jesus entered the most holy place once and for all by his blood and gave us eternal redemption or salvation as we see in chapter 5, verse 9 or 9, verse 12. So Jesus, once and for all, gave us the redemption and salvation by entering the most holy place. Jesus' blood cleanses our consciousness from acts that lead to death, and we can serve the living God. Jesus died as our ransom, giving us eternal inheritance. Jesus defeated the fear of death and broke the bondage of slavery. Jesus is now our eternal high priest uh, of the new covenant on the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Jesus is now crowned with glory and tasted death in his body once and for all, for all of us. Let me bring this point clear, although it's very uh, something that you understand. If you're born once, like all human beings are, and you're not born twice, you will uh, die twice. You will have a physical death and you will have a spiritual death. But if you are born again, if you're born in this earth, but as Nicodemus was taught, if you're born again, then, and, and you trust in the Lord Jesus until the very end of your life, then you're able to uh, have the eternal hope that waits for every one of us that are looking back, looking up for his coming or our death when we will spend eternity forever and ever with him. We'll see that the veil has been torn by the Lord Jesus. See, the Levitical priesthood veil, uh, has been torn that we can go approach his throne forever and ever and we can celebrate today as the worship team is coming up access to our father we have access to our father amen as that song says that jesus won it all on the cross for us jesus christ one uh, is the one that sacrificed for my sins, his work on my behalf as an accepted by God. 
He is my heavenly intercessor, and his blood is the antidote to the poison of the voices that are in my conscience that says that are condemning me for my many failures. Jesus chokes them into silence, and he has won the victory. As everyone can get to their feet, and we will meditate on this concluding portion. As we were singing earlier, Jesus intentionally walked into the arms of his betrayer. He didn't resist. He did not defend himself at a trial. He was willingly subjecting himself to this humiliating and agonizing form of torture, which is the cross. We talked about that last time. It's the worst kind of death that no Roman citizen does not even talk about. And Jesus endured that on the cross. Why? Because he took the punishment for each one of us. We see that he was sweating blood and we see that he paid forever a substitution paying the death penalty for us. He was flogged by a flagrum and his skin was already bleeding blood and we see that it was cut open. He was fully human and fully God. He felt pain to the point of sweating blood. What did he do? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God as it says in Hebrews 12 2. So as we sing and as we celebrate let us keep that in mind and if you keep in mind that we are not worthy that it is only the blood of Jesus then you cannot be silent you have to be jumping up and down and giving him the glory because you don't deserve it may God bless you all with the words